Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. The May 1984 National Geographic showed through color photos and drawings the swift and terrible destruction that wiped out the Roman cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum in AD 79. The explosion of Mount Vesuvius was so sudden, the residents were killed while in their routine. Men and women were at the market, the rich in their luxurious baths, slaves at toil. They died amid volcanic ash and superheated gases. Even family pets suffered the same quick and final fate. And it takes little imagination to picture the panic of that terrible day. And the saddest part is that these people did not have to die. Scientists confirm what ancient Roman writers record. Weeks of rumblings and shakings preceded the actual explosion. Even an ominous plume of smoke was clearly visible from the mountain days before the eruption. If only they had been able to read and respond to Vesuvius' warning. There is a day of judgment coming that will surprise and suddenly overtake the world after the rapture of the church. The Apostle Paul teaches the body of Christ about the rumblings that will take place in the last days prior to the dispensation of grace coming to a close. Only in the epistles of Paul, specifically in 1st and 2nd Timothy, do we find the trends that will mark the end of this current dispensation. The Lord's return for the church at the rapture could take place at any time. And as ambassadors for Christ, we have a responsibility to warn people of the terrible time of judgment that will come after the rapture, so that by trusting Christ as their Savior, they will not be tragically overcome and swept away like those at Pompeii. Acts 2, 16 to 20 reads, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. There are two last days taught in the Bible, one for each of God's programs, prophecy and the mystery. God has two programs to complete, His earthly program with Israel and His heavenly program with the body of Christ. When Peter stood up at the day of Pentecost to speak, the people present didn't know what was going on. But by the Holy Spirit, Peter knew exactly what was happening and prophecy was being fulfilled. The fulfillment of Joel's prophecy about Israel's last days had begun, and without qualification, Peter proclaimed to the crowd of Jews and proselytes, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He does not say, this is somewhat similar to what Joel prophesied. He states, plainly, as fact and truth, this is that. This is what Joel had prophesied, and that Israel's last days had begun. Now, Peter had recently been taught for 40 days by our risen Savior of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. On the day of Pentecost, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter had an intelligent and perfect understanding of where he stood in the program of God. It is difficult, very difficult, to dislodge a belief 
once it has been stated for so many years as the truth. And over the years, so many have pointed to this chapter, to the day of Pentecost, a Jewish feast day, as the beginning of the church, the body of Christ. But Peter did not say that the coming of the Holy Spirit was a sign of the first days of the church. He says it was a sign of the last days for God's program with the nation of Israel. And miraculous signs and wonders were to accompany the last days of God's prophetic program. According to Joel's prophecy, these signs include the pouring out of the Spirit, the gift of prophecy, visions, dreams, wonders in the heavens above, such as the darkening of the sun, the moon turning into blood, wonders in the earth beneath, such as blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. These things in Acts 2 agree with what you find in the prophetic scriptures, in the gospel records, in the book of Revelation regarding Israel's last days and the tribulation period. In the prophetic scriptures, in Isaiah 13, 9 to 10, we read, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened, like Peter said. And is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. In Ezekiel 37, 14, the Lord told Israel that under the new covenant, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that the Lord hath spoken it, and performed it, saith the Lord. In the Gospels, we read Matthew 24, 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. In Revelation 6, 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And, as Peter said, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Revelation 8, 7 to 8, and there followed hail and, like Peter said, fire, mingled with, like Peter said, blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Revelation 9, 18, by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the, like Peter said, smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. At Pentecost, the Spirit was poured out on Israel in accordance with prophecy in preparation for the prophesied time of the tribulation in the millennial kingdom to follow. However, the predicted wrath of the tribulation and the glory of the earthly kingdom never came because the prophetic program for Israel was interrupted. When Israel continued in her unbelief and rejection of her Messiah and King, even throughout the one-year period of the Holy Spirit's miraculous ministry in early Acts, Acts 1-7, to all was ready for judgment to fall. When the leaders of Israel stoned and killed Stephen with their own hands, a man full of the Holy Ghost, that was when the prophesied wrath of God would have been poured out on this world in fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Instead, God temporarily set Israel aside in unbelief, and he turned to the Gentiles. In boundless grace, God saved Paul on the road to Damascus, the chief of sinners and leader of the rebellion against his son, and he called him to be the apostle of the Gentiles. Christ revealed the dispensation of the grace of God to Paul, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Then the Lord sent Paul out to the world as the herald and living demonstration of the grace he is showing to all people today. We know the whole story by the completed word of God and the revelation of the mystery given to Paul. 
But Peter on the day of Pentecost did not know that God would break off these signs, hold back the day of judgment, and usher in an age of grace. The prophets of Israel predicted the sufferings of Christ, the time of judgment in the tribulation, the second coming of Christ, the glory of the earthly kingdom, but they knew absolutely nothing about the dispensation of grace or the church, the body of Christ. And neither did Peter on the day of Pentecost because the message of grace for today was still hid in God until it was later revealed to the Apostle Paul. The last days, according to prophecy, began at Pentecost, but they were temporarily interrupted by the dispensation of grace. And now this dispensation has its own last days. Thus, there are two last days because God has two programs to complete. For the subject of the last days to make sense, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. A distinction must be made between the last days for Israel, according to prophecy, and the last days for the body of Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. When the last days of grace and the rapture of the body of Christ takes place, Israel's last days will pick up right where they left off and they will run their course to completion. At that time, all the prophesied end times, the last day events for Israel will take place just as God has said, which includes first the seven year tribulation with its wars, pestilences, natural disasters and judgments. At the end of the tribulation, the second coming of Christ at the Battle of Armageddon, followed by the Millennial Kingdom on Earth. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Basic Distinctions Between Prophecy and the Mystery is a full-color tract written by Pastor Cornelius R. Stamm. In this tract, Pastor Stamm very effectively makes a comparison between prophecy and the mystery, giving scripture to prove the distinctions. It is a great tool to share the word, rightly divided. They sell in packages of 25 or 100. To order, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262 255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, Back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. 1 Timothy 4.1 reads, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. When the Apostle Paul writes in his letters about the last days or the latter times, he is speaking of the closing days of the current age of grace. When the last days are mentioned outside of Paul's letters, it is speaking of the last days for God's program with Israel. The last days for Israel were prophesied, but the entire dispensation of grace is an unprophesied period, including its last days. This means that no prophecy is being fulfilled today. No current event was ever foretold in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Matthew, Luke, and so on. No natural disaster, no tragedy, no war, no heavenly phenomenon, and this dispensation is a fulfillment of any Bible prophecy. The terror attack of 9-11 has nothing to do with one prophecy in your Bible. Absolutely nothing that happens today in this dispensation is found in the book of Revelation. Revelation is all future. It will all take place after the body of Christ has been taken to heaven. Any preacher, teacher, author, television personality, website 
that attempts to equate a current event with a prophecy in your Bible is in error. When they do, it shows that they don't understand the mystery. The body of truth for the present dispensation, which God kept secret since the world began. We live in an unprophesied time, unseen by the prophets in the past. They never saw this dispensation. Now, it is very possible that God could be setting the stage for the tribulation and for the fulfillment of prophecy after the rapture, but none of what is happening in the world today is a direct fulfillment of any prophecy outside of Paul's letters. No tsunami, earthquake, tornado, hurricane, war, terror attack, corrupt leader, pandemic, or strife between nations is a sign that we are in our last days. In the last days of Israel's program, during the tribulation, there will indeed be specific signs preceding the second coming of Christ to earth when he comes to judge and to reign. Some of these signs were the sun being turned to darkness, the moon turned to blood, such as Peter noted in Acts 2. And regarding these signs of Messiah's return, Israel was taught, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. However, when, the, when Paul speaks of the last days of the present dispensation of grace, he speaks of trends rather than specific signs or world events that will precede its end. One such trend is the some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But there are no signs given to reveal that the rapture to catch the body of Christ to heaven is near, and then we should look up for his coming. Nothing whatsoever is taught in Paul's letters as to how long this dispensation will last or exactly when it will be brought to a close. To a close. Every day is a day of pure grace in which God is giving everyone an opportunity to be saved before the judgment of the tribulation is poured out on this world. And every single day is a day Christ could come. We are taught to be constantly looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The rapture is always imminent. This, in turn, makes the sharing of the gospel with the world always urgent because we don't know when grace will end and judgment will begin. The imminent hope of the rapture, I love this aspect of it, is that it's God's way of having his church keep Christ on our hearts and minds, which is key, absolutely key to our spiritual growth. We don't look for signs, we look for Christ. We walk by faith, not by sight. Living by faith in the rapture, the coming of Christ, can transform our lives. Because by knowing and believing in the daily possibility of the appearing of the Lord, the Creator, our personal Savior, is to inspire and challenge us to live for Him to live a life which honors the one who died for us, rose again for us, and is coming for us. God's heart is huge, and that's an understatement even saying that. His long-suffering, His grace, His mercy and love is so great towards sinners that in giving all people an opportunity to be saved in this dispensation by grace through faith, this dispensation could go on another 50 years, 500 years, 5,000 years, 5 million years, or according to his perfect plans and purposes, he could come in the next five minutes. 2 Timothy 3, 1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. 
Maybe you've heard the old joke about the guy who was told, hey, cheer up, things could be worse. He replied, I did as I was told. I cheered up, and sure enough, things got worse. That's what Paul taught Timothy. Things are going to get worse, worse and worse, in the last days of the dispensation of grace. Paul warns Timothy, this know also. It's, I want you to understand this. It was like Paul poking Timothy in the chest with each syllable. This know also. And in the original Greek, it is in the present tense, so it means know it and keep on knowing it. In other words, remember it. We need to know and remember. The this that Paul wanted Timothy to know and remember is that in the last days of grace, perilous times will come. Paul gives Timothy and us, the church, a correct orientation about the future. And he's teaching us that things are not going to get better and better. And we shouldn't expect it. Things will go from bad to worse and will get worse and worse before the Lord comes. In 2 Timothy 3.1, the last days refers to this age of grace, this current program of grace. Paul is writing to us, the body of Christ, and he teaches us that perilous times will come and mark the last days of grace. The Greek word for perilous is used only one other time in the New Testament. It is used to describe two demonized men living in the caves near Gadara. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. These two men were possessed by demons and empowered by evil. They were wild, uncontrollable men who broke the chains that bound them and terrorized the region with extreme violence. And the verse says that they were exceeding fierce. Fierce is translated from the same Greek word as perilous in 2 Timothy 3.1. And thus the last days of grace will be like these two men, wild, uncontrolled, evil, exceeding fierce as people cast off all moral restraint. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Nineteen different characteristics are spelled out in four verses, which give strong reasons why the closing days of this age will be perilous. And if we didn't know any better, these verses almost sound like what we just read on our news app, on our phone, or watched on television today. All of these things are things we see in the world today. With the promotion, acceptance, and boldness of evil, deception, and immorality in our world currently, it's easy to see how the time we live in could be the last days. Because we constantly hear about another murder-suicide, of a mass shooting, a baby in a dumpster, financial corruption and fraud within major corporations. We see preachers on television in $50,000 suits telling people to send them money and promising God will bless them if they do, and people do it. False teachers set dates for the end of the world, and people believe it. We see political corruption from greedy, proud, power-hungry, lying rulers in government. You can't take your children to public places without covering their ears from people who can't control their tongues and cuss and swear without abandon. We see injustice, immorality, indecency on every hand, and it all makes you wonder, Lord, is this it? Are these the last days? And the answer is possibly yes and possibly no. Because every generation during this dispensation could very easily claim the sin and wickedness listed in 2 Timothy 3, and for all the godlessness in the last days, Paul began with the root problem in verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. 
All the other characteristics and sins that follow this one can be traced back and attributed to this root problem. As we approach the consummation of this age, Paul says people will become more and more self-centered. And self-love is a humanistic attitude which is taught as a philosophy of life in the world today. And that is a base passion, a narrow passion. It is diametrically opposed to the teaching of God's Word, which says that we should love God with all of our heart and love others as Christ loves them. Loving self is what leads people to try to find their God within themselves and to boldly believe that they can be their own Savior. And loving self is what leads people to be covetous people, boasters, proud, blasphemers, to be unthankful, without natural affection, truce breakers, and lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, and so on. To sum up Paul's list for the last days, it's anything goes. No rules, no respect, no restraint. It'll be like in the days of the book of Judges where every man will do that which is right in their own eyes. All these trends will increase in intensity and frequency in the last days among all people. When the Lord comes, however, we go through this list, it's kind of depressing. But when the Lord comes in the twinkling of, a, of an eye, we'll leave it all behind. We don't know for certain when he's coming. But as we see these trends so widespread in the world today, it reminds us that every day really is a possible day that Christ might come. And knowing that is so, remember to warn and reach out to the unbelieving around you who stand in danger every day of being left behind to face the judgment to come in the tribulation and to share the wonderful gospel of the wonderful grace of God, that God loves you. Christ died for your sins and rose again. And just trust this good news and you are saved from all of your sins in heaven bound. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.